This is, uh, my name is Inez Hedges, and I'm standing in for Dean Stevens at the Community Church of Boston. Welcome, everyone. And as you know, Dean always starts with lighting a candle, so I'm going to do the same. And here it is. We're lighting the candle today to express the hope that the Palestinian and Jewish populations of the Middle East will find the way to peaceful coexistence. We take a moment to think about all the world's refugees and prisoners, wherever they may be. We who live in safe, warm homes and do not hunger, we are the privileged. We stop to reflect on what we can do to help. Today, we're going to welcome Professor Linda Dittmar speaking about her new book, Tracing Homelands. I will introduce her later. First, we're going to hear a song from Ron McDonald. Ron, Rod McDonald is a brilliant, socially conscious American singer, songwriter, novelist, and educator. In the 1980s, he played a major role in the folk revival in Greenwich Village where he co-founded the Greenwich Village Folk Festival. If you were there, you might have caught his performances at the Speakeasy, The Bottom Line, Folk City, or the Cornelia, Cornelia Street Cafe. Cafe. He, has he has a new a album, album Rants and Romance, and Romance, which is doing very well. well. It's, it's most appropriate that he joins us today today with Linda. with Linda. Ron, Ron please, start please start your song. song. Thank you, Inez. Good morning, everybody. Hey, is anybody listening? Are you all alone, wherever it is you are? You know I'm just sitting here thinking Or maybe I'm just wishing on a star And if there's somebody out there Who can recognize a single word I say I'd like to ask a simple blessing for all of us, while we're all the way Heal the world, heal the world It's a simple prayer, sing it everywhere Heal the world, heal the world, heal the world It's a simple prayer, sing it everywhere Heal the world Now we don't need another mountain we don't need someone to lead us to the light We just need to learn to live together And I believe the rest will turn out alright Heal the world, heal the world It's a simple prayer, sing it everywhere Heal the world, heal the world It's a simple prayer, sing it everywhere, heal the world. Sing 
Thank you, Rod. You can see how appropriate it, what it is that we have him sing just before Linda Dittmore speaks. Linda will be speaking to us about her new book, Tracing Homelands, Israel, Palestine, and the Claims of Belonging. This uncannily well-timed book tells of her journey of historical discovery and self-discovery along the way. Born in Tel Aviv, but moving to the US, where she has lived since the 1960s, Linda has been at the forefront of several intellectual currents during her lifetime. She was among the first to teach film studies at the college level when that was an emerging field. Her book on the Vietnam War in American film helps us to understand that historical catastrophe. In her academic work at UMass Boston, Linda has been a pioneer in gender studies as well as film studies and held important editorial positions on the journal Radical Teacher. In point of fact, Linda herself has always been a radical teacher. If you allow yourself the pleasure of reading her new book, you will see what I mean. The lessons she learned as she traversed the Israeli landscape during the past several years in search of buried Palestinian history offer opportunities for all of us to reflect about the claims of belonging. As philosopher Ernst Bloch, himself, himself a refugee in World War II, once said, we are not yet at home in the world. Let's embark on this journey with Linda and find the traces of what could become a home for all. Please welcome Linda Dittmar. I have some notes to remind me things I need to focus on, okay? Okay, so I want to start by thanking Dean Stevens for inviting me here and Amar Ahmed for helping us, navigating us through that. And of course, Inez for also uh, introducing me to this place and, and, and Victor as well. Uh, and for the lovely introduction, I'm very moved by it. Uh, to Rod McDonald for the wonderful song, and for all of you who are here and the people who are on Zoom both. I want to explain a couple of words about my own background and the book. We call it a book, but it is specifically a memoir. And it is very unusual considering that I was born in 1938 and therefore was 10 during the, the 48, the War of Independence or the Nakba, depending which side you are on, that uh, I remember some of it as a child. I didn't understand it, but I saw things, and the book does talk about that. Mainly this book is uh, grown out of four years in which I traveled 
across the land within the Green Line Zone, that is the, is the pre-67 war, uh, looking for p the remains of Palestinian villages uh, that are really hidden in the country. It's extremely hard to find them. And uh, that was a big change in my own life because until then I really could not deal with that at all. In Israel at that time, in the early uh, 2000, talking about the Nakba was essentially unmentionable. The word didn't exist among the Jewish population, essentially. And it took a, uh, a very difficult uh, uh, step for me personally to cross that barrier and recognize the Nakba and, and uh, then in the company of a photographer, Deborah, and I'll be mentioning her a bit in my reading, we started walking through the country, trying to find what you can. Much of it is buried under trees, what we call, the, what, what the Jewish National Fund called uh, making the desert bloom, is in fact forests that were planted over Palestinian villages. And we had to walk and, and look and some of it is hidden inside clumps of, uh, of cactuses that are just uh, seemingly part of the landscape, but in fact are the remains of Palestinian villages. The cactuses are hard to eradicate. So if you travel and you see a cactus clump, you know that there was Palestinian habitation where that clump is standing. Um, there are remains of mosques around the country and also of Sheikh tombs. And uh, most of them, people drive by and don't recognize what they're seeing. They paid no attention to it. In the entrance to the city of Safed in the Galilee, there is a roundabout at the entrance. And in the roundabout is a minaret. And it stands there like some kind of public art. Nobody stops to think there was a mosque at that particular intersection. What I'm saying is that the country is just filled with these kind of remains. The only problem is that it's almost impossible to find them. And in this collection, I'll give credit to two people. The first one was the Israeli writer, Meron Ben Venisti, who wrote a wonderful book about precisely the Israeli uh, appropriation of Palestinian uh, villages, towns, buildings. And he's the one who actually alerted Deborah and me to, to pay attention to that. Until I read it, never occurred to me to even notice that. The other person is Walid Khalidi, who uh, wrote an encyclopedic, huge encyclopedic book called All That Remains. And in that book, he lists every village, not the cities, not Jaffa and Haifa and so on, but he, he lists all the city, uh, villages. And it's based initially on the British census because Palestine was then under British control. And he gives you the statistics about each village, how many houses were there, how many schoolhouses, what crops were grown, what was the economy of that village, everything. And what Halidi did later on is he and other researchers went to revisit those villages and all that remains, his book, is what you can see now, which is horrendous when you see it. It's basically piles of rubble if you can see anything at all, okay? So in the beginning, Deborah and I decided to, to go and, and find what we can. And Khalidi, even though he's very detailed, was not helpful because he doesn't tell you where to find these things. He only tells you what remains. And his maps are just some kind of an outline than the dot in the outline. You don't even know what road passes by. So how do you find? And during the first year, we had a hard time finding places. The second year we went to an Israel, very, at that time, new Israeli organization called Zohot, which actually makes it their point to um, locate and register and visit the remains of Palestinian villages. So they helped us a lot, and I write about them in the book. 
but that was on the second year, not the first year. The first year we were really kind of looking blindly for whatever we could find and really could find next to nothing. So um, that is a lot of what was going on for us. The book was written during, I wouldn't call it quiet time, but static time politically uh, between basically, uh, uh, well, 10 years ago until recently. And it was written before the attack on Gaza, okay? And of course now the situation is so much uglier and worse and brutal in a way that the book was not anticipating at the time. So the book is really a memoir that has to do with the Nakba and my own coming of age or discovery of that and my own share or responsibility as part of the Israeli public but I was not looking ahead to what we are seeing today. And the only thing I can say about that is that you can see in my own journey how it leads to what is happening today. Even though I didn't anticipate it, the, the line is right there. And one of the things that I talk about is actually the education that I personally got as a child and into adulthood about how to look at the Palestinian population that was mostly missing by the time I reached the age of reason. Um, and, and also looking at the, the strain within Zionist ideology that I would now call fascistic and actually that I call my parents called fascistic too. I did hear that word at home even though I didn't know what it meant at the time. And, and that is, uh, and most recently, and I want to, to mention that because people would not have noticed that, one of uh, Netanyahu's important current politicians is this guy, Smotrich, who was in America talking to the Jewish population recently and then went to France and talked there. And I happened to see a video of him talking in Paris and he, ha he was standing in front of a podium just like this one, and there was a banner hanging in front of that podium, and the banner had a strange shape on it. And I am sure that almost nobody knew what that strange shape was. There were no words on it. The shape was basically the whole outline of British Palestine, Mandate Palestine, and then Jordan next to it. And that was the symbol, actually, of the uh, Jewish militia, the Irgun, or IZL, uh, which I discovered for the first time in 1961 when I met a young woman in City College in New York who was wearing that pin in her lapel with that strange shape. Now, everybody there were wearing peace signs, you know, those circles. But she was wearing this, so I said to her, what are you, what is that? And she said to me, two banks to the Jordan. And then I looked it up on the internet, and basically, because I couldn't see it very clearly on her, uh, this was the insignia of the Irgun, and it had both Jordan and Palestine as one state, and over it, and a hand holding a weapon, and the words under it were rak kach, which in Hebrew means only this way. And this year, Smotrich was showing this very shape in his banner, which says to you, it's not just Gaza, it's not just the occupied territories, it's two banks to the Jordan. It's the king of Jordan too. I mean, insane though it sounds, he was actually still advocating that. So um, clearly what I'm doing today is in the new crucible of complaints and criticism of anti-Semitism and, and rigid, rigid fury and pain that is being experienced. The Israelis in their own way too, I have to say the attack by Hamas on those particularly progressive villages was particularly painful, um, but also, and much worse, what Israel is doing in Gaza today. I just needed to acknowledge both. 
So what I'm going to do now is read to you uh, from my book, uh, and then we can have some discussion. I'll be reading sections. I won't be reading just one piece, but a way of introducing you a little bit to my th experience and my thinking. Walking through a field or a forest, you may come across the remains of a house or perhaps a caved-in well or an oil press overrun by brambles. In some places, the scent of wild thyme, thyme za'atar may reach you. In others, it might be the scent of a newly planted pine trees or the pungent dust of grass disintegrating under a harsh sun. In late summer, figs and then pomegranates ripen when nobody is left to pick them. Speeding on Israel's paved roads, one rarely notices signs of the Nakba, even when some ruin or an abandoned tomb or a mosque come into view, especially in built-up areas. They've been absorbed into Israel's evolving vernacular and ornamental architecture in ways that disguise what they are, let alone what they used to be. Does it matter that a lone fig tree happens to stand near a pile of stones in an empty field? Or that a lovely restaurant had once been a mosque? Or that a grocery in a small Israeli village built of beautifully chiseled stones used to be a Palestinian two-room schoolhouse? Once you know enough to notice this grafting of the new on the old, Israel no longer looks the same. Seen through the filter of the Nakba, both the bucolic beauty of its countryside and the dynamic effervescent, effervescence of its modernity are shadowed by lives erased from the land that sustained them for centuries. Though proof of the Nakba was everywhere, it remained unnamed among us Israeli Jews, a forbidden zone where none was to enter. Victorious and aglow with the accounts of Jewish heroism, our response to the, the Nazi atrocities that continue to sear our collective memory, we had only contempt for the people we called the Arabs, denying the local identity, not calling them even Palestinian. Steeped in dread of the, of the unknown ahead of us, the pre-1948 population, the Yishuv, and the nearly, newly arrived Jewish refugees clung together in a desperate need to ensure our own survival. The Nakba was a ghostly presence we could not afford to see. Of course, I rejected Deborah's suggestion. Deborah is not Jewish, by the way. That, uh, of course, I rejected her suggestion that we document the Nakba. It took 12 years for my resistance to crumble, not because of any sudden awakening or a flash of life-changing insight, but through a slow journey into a murky territory where the harsh realities kept crashing against mythic utopian Zionism. Giving the Nakba image and voice, I hoped, would make peace and restitution possible. Photographing the residues of the Nakba would not be about hazily remote wars, as Deborah's earlier work had been. She was a war photographer for historic wars, but about fighting alive within memory and continuing in Gaza, the Golan, the occupied territories, and inside Israel itself. This slow and painful process of peeling the film of my eyes is the subject of this book. Growing up in British Palestine as it became Israel between 1939 and 1960, and born to a Zionist family that settled in the 19th century, I was steeped in our narrative of national becoming. Ancient expulsions and migrations, conquests and exiles, the Spanish Inquisition, ravage, ravaging pogroms and the Holocaust, the early Aliyah Im immigrations with women dying in childbirth and the pioneers dying in malaria, 
the ghetto fighters and the Jewish partisans of World War II, Hannah Senesh parachuting into Nazi-occupied Hungary to rescue Jews, Britain denying Europe's Jews refugees shelters in, in Palestine, and much more. By the way, when I was growing up, nobody talked about America denying them entrance too. Tragedy and heroism were entwined in this story as I was taught it in school, in the neighborhood, and at home. Bekol dor vedor, in every generation, as the Passover Haggadah tells us, they rise to annihilate us. They, shape-shifting shape, shape from one era to the next, always against us. Ours was not Hollywood's frothy tale of handsome blue-eyed Paul Newman leading the ship Exodus to safe haven as Ari ben Knan, but a grim history where the rules of engagement and supposed ethics of combat crumbled. In my young imagination, this history was bound between the heroic defenders of Tel Chai in the 1920s and the youth who, in 1948, risked their lives to defend the convoys to besiege Jerusalem at the narrow ravine of Babel Wad. For me, growing up in fledgling Israel, training through high school in the Gadna Youth Brigades, then serving in the defense, in Israel's defense forces, uh, there was nothing more inspiring than our shared love of land and pride in our nation. There were, I believed, these were, I believed, the only just responses to the appalling history we had inherited. And then, so our national narrative went, after millennia of suffering and dispossession, after the Ottomans and the British left, after the United Nations voted to confirm our right to statehood, and the land we believed ours all along would finally become our refuge, the entire Arab world rose to destroy it as we saw it, not giving a thought to what the Palestinians were losing through our rebirth. For me, like so many others swept by the gales of this history, what happened to them, the Palestinians, seemed secondary to our own desperate need to survive centuries of unrelenting genocidal hate. During my school years and for decades beyond, the word Nakba didn't exist, let alone the historic facts it invoked. It was only our own suffering we studied at school, closely, obsessively, year after year. Okay, so I'll stop with that, but it gives you a sense of the history that not only me comes out of, but Israel comes out of. And I want to, to read you another aspect of that history too, which has to do with uh, immigration and what it was like, and again, uh, the Palestinians. It's a mysterious process, this opening of eyes, often imperceptible and hard to define, a matter of will as well as opportunity. Since I first be told Deborah about cactuses in 1993, and especially after our time in Bech An, uh, I'll tell you about that separately, I felt dogged by a silent history shadowing the one I knew. By 2005, during Deborah's first visit to Israel, I was seeing my country in new ways that I was still reluctant to name. Avoiding the Nakba, I talked instead about seismic upheaval of absorbing masses of refugees and destitute immigrants, a truthful account she'd care about, but also for me, a self-justification that led me, led me to bypass the Nakba. It is a triumphalist story of regeneration tarnished by what it does not say about the very immigration we extol. Our ingathering of exiles was our manifest destiny, driven by a desperate wish to be, quote, a free people in our own country, as our national anthem has it. 
inevitably it was also a settler colonial project imbued with racism both external towards the Palestinians and internal Jew against Jew. I'll never forget the crowding and chaos of this ingathering, including the long hours waiting on food lines. Anybody who had a spare room had to take in strangers during those early years of upheaval. My great uncle and aunt among them. The small apartments of Kiryat Meir estate housed two families to two room units with fights erupting over shared kitchen and bathroom and husbands coming to blows in the street. Harder yet was the fate of Jaffa's Jewish refugees, most of them Mizrahim, which means from the Eastern Arab countries, who spilled into any available space after the 48 fighting began, turning Tel Aviv into a shanty town. There were families living in shipping containers and in corrugated iron and cardboard shacks, lone individuals curled behind sandbag walls, and families crowding into entrance hallways, half hidden by threadbare blankets hanging from fraying ropes. On rainy days, steam would rise from the flooded pavements, releasing the musty smell of damp bedrolls and unfamiliar foods cooked in, on rickety primus burners. None of the children I sometimes glimpsed behind those partitions went to my neighborhood school. Like the world at large, we too recoiled from the Holocaust survivors, unsettling though it was to see their tattooed arms, the tattoos also whispered to us that we, Ashkenazi, that is European, old timer uh, old-timer Jews, were better than them, a truly free people, untainted by the diaspora's wretched legacy of victimization. To our arrogant Ashkenazi eyes, all Mizrahi Jews seemed backwards, problematic, and primitive. Yemenites, Iraqis, North Africans, and other Mizrahi and Sfaradins. Arab seeming in custom and skin color, their language, food, clothes, music, and even liturgy challenge the Europeans' relative wealth, their control of the country, and their smug sense of superiority. The Israel I grew up in was not the proverbial melting pot, but the pressure cooker with its valve loose. There were too many traumatized people among us, with too many histories, languages, cultures, and kinds of pain. For all the embrace of the often sung hymn, Hine Matov, taken from Psalm 133, we were hardly brothers, let alone together. Hine Matov Umanaim, I sang to Deborah, behold, and behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. But are these really Jews, the old Ashkenazi Yeshuv wondered? Okay, so this is, this is the world I grew up in. Uh, and this is the world that is leading us to Gaza also today uh, with the position of the Mizrahim in Israel changing. And actually, tragically, they become part of the more right-wing group of Israeli Zionists even though they were not through the Holocaust and all of that, it's, it's a complicated kind of history, but I did want to um, mention that. I want to read now a different story, and that is really about tourism in Israel. Now, I mentioned before that uh, Deborah and I were traveling together, and actually the first insight was in the beginning, she, she just came as a tourist and all we were going to see were sites and antiquities. And we were going to see the Roman site, archeological site of Bech An in the Valley of Jezreel. And um, uh, we arrived a little bit too early, had time to kill, and I saw on the map a green line road that showed that it's a scenic road. So I said, let's take the scenic road and find out. It was just a detour. And it was a forest. 
and lo and behold, the JNF, the Jewish National Forests, are all planted at the same time, exactly the same palm trees. There's no variety among them whatsoever. It's like a machine that planted a tree and a tree and a tree and a tree, all of it in, in essence to occupy the land and prevent Palestinians from returning to their own villages in that place. So we are driving through one of those uh, forests which are considered scenic, and I see markers that look like tombstones, actually, to the left of the road. And they were spaced a certain distance from one another. And I said, let's stop and see what these are about. And it turned out that they were marker, memorial markers for the Jewish communities who donated the money to plant those trees. And we, I know we in school and many American Jewish fo homes had little boxes for the Jewish National Fund where they put little coins in every year, every week. And we did it every Friday night to welcome the Sabbath in my school. That's how those forests were planted. But of course, there were some big donors too. And the, the, the markers were heartbreaking. So you see a memorial to the such and such community from Romania and another marker for a synagogue in Canada, and so on and so on as you drive along the way. And at some point, I also looked to the opposite side. So the markers were to the left, which was to the north, and I looked to the south. And I saw that the forest is coming to a very abrupt end, very suddenly. Clearly, that is the beginning of the, I realized, of the uh, no man land separating the, the, the Palestinian side from us. And it was late afternoon and you could see some lights coming up in the distance. And I realized these are Palestinian villages on the other side. And not only that, but the lights could have been from Jenin. Jenin was very, very close to that part of the border, in fact. And it dawned on me that I'm seeing these two catastrophes on two sides of the road facing one another. That kind of facing one another is actually kind of horribly present in Israel. And I will just mention now the village near Jerusalem, notorious village called Dir Yassin. Dir Yassin had a terrible, terrible massacre of Palestinians during the War of 48. It's the only massacre that until recently was acknowledged in general knowledge. Uh, that one was not erasable because what the uh, militia, the uh, Stern Gang, Olechi, who did it, did was af after the massacre, they took the, f the survivors and paraded, th paraded them in Jerusalem. So nobody could say, I didn't know about Dir Yassin. But, uh, Zohrot, this organization that commemorates the villages, uh, also wrote brochures for each village. In their brochure for Dir Yassin, they point the ironic and very accurate fact that Dir Yassin is on top of a hillside and there's a valley and the other hillside is where Yad Vashem is, which is the uh, museum to commemorate the Holocaust. In Dir Yassin, when I went there, I couldn't find it. And later on, somebody, a friend explained to me what there is and how to find it. What they did was take the remaining buildings and turn it into a mental hospital. And there is a big, big and very strong fence around it so that you really can't go. And they know that when you have people like me coming and looking at it with curiosity, we know the history. So the guard didn't, uh, the gate didn't let me come at near the, the gate even to take a photograph. But the brochure for Zohrot points the irony that in Dir Yassin, we are told never to remember. And in Yad Vashem, we are told always to remember. And that is uh, the conjunction, and that is what I experienced on the way to Bet Shan as well. So another uh, historical site, and perhaps one of the two most popular with tourists, the other one is Masada, uh, is uh, Caesarea, 
which was an important Roman port, and actually later on the Crusades uh, also used it. And, but it was, during Roman time, highly developed by King Herod. And there's extensive um, uh, excavations there and still going on more excavations. It's a highly interesting and developing ruins if that's all you want to see, okay? All right. So except for Akko, where my family used to eat at Abu Christo's fish restaurant and stroll along the old port, I mainly knew, knew the Israeli coast as a sandy stretch. No, I'm going to skip a little. I'm sorry, in the interest of time. So I arrived to, to Caesarea. Visitors are streaming towards the ticket booth by the time we parked our car and let ourselves be channeled along newly paved walkways lined with colorful banners and gift shops nestled under vaulted ceilings. Tastefully selected wares were beckoning from behind glass, exotic jewelry, ceramics, imitation antique metal and glassware, textiles for local visitors, menorahs and mezuzahs for American and European Jews. It was hard to resist these shops as we passed by. When I finally did look up, I froze. Oh my, I said, clutching Deborah's arm. A minaret, brightly lit by the morning sun, rose in front of us, towering above the stone buildings clustered below. I'd forgotten all about it. For us, steeped in thinking about the Nakba, there was no denying the incongruity of this minaret and its adjacent mosque stripped of their religious use and seemingly planted there like public art. In our eyes, the minaret loomed as a spectral witness to the Palestinian village that was here before the Nakba. For me, it was also a shocking reminder that shortly after the war, I had seen this very village and its mosque emptied of people and lying in ruins. Perhaps it was a sensation of the humid air depositing a thin film of salt on my arms that brought back the rush of memories. Certainly it was the minaret. The vaulted gift shops, I have since realized, had been derelict village buildings when I last saw them, back in the early 1950s. The minaret had been the village's pumping heart. The tower, the muezzin, would climb five times a day to call the believers to prayer. By now, both the entry to the, minaret, to the minaret and the doorway opening into the muezzin's balcony had been sealed with concrete. Abandoned, the minaret stood purposeless, ignored by tourists intent on getting to the archeological site. Then, I told Deborah, right after the war, I climbed that minaret more than once, I said, my voice trailing off as a bit of memory tugged at me. One memory wouldn't let go, a small black and white snapshot, now long gone, taken a year or two after the war. At the top is a gangly me in shorts and a white, t in a white tank top, waving from the balcony. I see my father yet again, his hair ruffled by the breeze, standing in his dark bathing trunks that way below me, near the mosque, still young, taking the picture. My spindly little sister is standing nearby as he aims the camera up towards me yet again. It was just an ordinary beach day, and the father amused by his, the feat his daughter had just accomplished. Look at me, Dad, I may have called, waving. While the climb was creepy, stepping out into the narrow muezzin balcony took more courage. I braved those steps more than once, and it was scary every time, though emerging into the balcony never failed to exhilarate me. With the sea glistening behind and salty breezes easing the scorching heat, I was enthralled by vistas spreading below. Clustered nearby, was the abandoned village looking peaceful as it lay empty of people at the rim of the bay where sandy dunes edged to the sea, 
north and south, as far as you could see. When I look back at that young me, I wonder about her elation. Yes, I loved measuring my young body to the task and the burst of light that dispelled the darkness. But now that I've paused many times since to gaze at panoramas, I wonder, I wonder whether this bird's eye view might not only also include, hidden in its folds, a sense of dominion. Uh, the raw power bestowed by heights practiced in a child's game of king of the mountain. What is there about those vistas that spread below us beyond beauty and awe and geographic knowledge? Does their allure lie, at least in part, in a sense of possession? A coveting, a drive to possess, and already an inkling of incipient ownership. The land that stretched before us was available to be known, husbanded, and mastered. And if the words I suggest rape, I had that in mind when I used them. It was not proof of the Nakba that rattled me that day in Caesarea. What struck me was the indifference of passers-by to this relic of a disastrous past, a past that is unseen even when it is in full view. Neither my father taking that photograph nor the girl that was me could claim that we never noticed the minaret or the derelict buildings nearby. But what did such noticing mean? The word Nakba was only lately and still barely come into Hebrew use. If anything, Caesarea's mosque and minaret, assuming they are allowed to remain, are likely to become even less noticeable now that an ambitious new excavations are underway. The ancient port Deborah and I only saw submerged is now being excavated. The city walls are being restored. I, however, still remember peering into fire-blackened cavernous storage spaces that are now gift shops, piled high with war after the war with unidentifiable refuse smelling of smoke and decay. So, you know, I, I wanted, I mean, a lot of the book is in a way confessional. It is really my experience and the absolute compassion, uh, compulsion to, to go th through that uh, and, and acknowledge what I had experienced. Um, what I want to mention now, and it is in the book, I mean, of course, there's a lot more there, but, but I have a chapter that deals with Dir Yassin specifically, and I want to read a little bit from that as well. Um, So I won't describe to you the difficulty of finding it, the process where I learned it's a mental hospital. Uh, an interesting uh, detail that I mentioned too is a movie by a guy called Woody Aloni who now lives in New York, I believe. Uh, he, he made that movie inside Dear Yassin with two Holocaust surviving men as, as mad people who are remembering but meanwhile connecting it very much to the Nakba and what Dir Yassin used to be. But my friend Nurit uh, is the one who told me how to find it. And she came from a very near village and uh, wanted to show me yet another village nearby, the village of Kalunia, uh, which is on almost, it overlooks the road to Jerusalem, essentially very near Jerusalem. So one day, she and Deborah and her hu Nurit's husband, Amos, and I took a little stroll to see Kalunia and photograph Kalunia. It was a lovely day, and Nurit's husband, Amos, came along, making it something like a family outing. For once, we also had a guide. Nurit knew the place and wouldn't lead us into another blood's, bl blind scramble. 
At the bottom of the hill, we found the remains of Calunia, a few skeletal buildings, and some rusting pieces of agricultural machinery, whether Jewish or Palestinian was hard to say. What was unexpected had to do with Amos, not the place. Amos was now over 80, leaning on a cane and walking with difficulty. We had to go slowly so that he could keep up with us. But in 1947 and into 1948, until he joined the Haganah, the IDF, Amos had been active, an active member of the radical Lehi or Stern Gang militia, defined by its actions as terrorist, although it could equally claim the anti-colonial freedom fighter label. Bridges were blown up, British soldiers killed randomly at close range. There was no hesitation about answering the call to fire and blood. On September 17, 1948, Lehimen assassinated the United Nations peace negotiator, Count Folk Bernadotte, changing what could have been a different course of history. This is a now almost forgotten chapter, but he, Count Bernadotte, had a very reasonable peace plan that was derailed by his assassination, essentially. The American who was his second uh, was uh, the African-American politician Ralph Bunch, actually, and he withdrew from that when Bernadotte was assassinated. Nurit had already told me that Amos was among those who attacked Dir Yassin in 48. What I did not realize as we started walking towards Kalunia was that he was suffering from dementia. None of us spoke on our way downhill. But once we reached Kalunia's derelict houses, memories of that horrific assault crowded in on Amos. He paused and leaning on his cane was urgently trying to tell me something. Starting and restarting, his speech was slurred and incoherent, though occasional phrases, words, and names tumbled out as we walked. The shooting, Dir Yassin, at the gate, the sound of, I was left, Dir Yassin, they entered, he carried me, Dir Yassin, the sound. Amos was wounded during that battle, though it's unclear where. Um, a well-known journalist, author, artist, and public intellectual, he had been there during the attack on Dir Yassin, wounded during the battle. Where, when, and how is unclear. Perhaps it was early on at the gate, as he often claimed. Perhaps it was inside the village, as he once or twice conceded to Nurit. Perhaps an hour or so into the battle, but perhaps earlier. Perhaps he didn't see anything. Perhaps he really didn't remember. I later read Nurit's book, Unrepented, Four Chapters in the Life of Amos Kenan, which includes lengthy excerpts from her interviews with him. In them, Nurit is persistent, Amos intractable, increasingly irritable, even hostile. And I'm quoting from him, from her book. I don't remember. I don't know, don't remember, didn't see, not exactly, apparently, and again, don't remember. Then, as Nurit's questions close in on whether he killed a Palestinian woman, no, I don't remember something that is a weapon in my hand, he says, and I'm getting fed up with this interview. I didn't remember I shot a woman. I don't remember. But apparently, I shot. Apparently, it was a woman. It's impossible to be clear about what Amos did at the time or said about it later. And that's probably how he wanted it. It's a story wrapped in contradictions and crazed with blind alleys, recorded before he retreated into dementia and made more confused by the time he was trying to tell me about it. The Amos, we see, the Amos we see in Nurit's book was always elusive, even as a child. Garbled memory, I now think, is a good way to hide. Uh, 
I don't know if any of you have seen the movie, which is available on the internet called Tantura, but that is about another massacre that was discovered by a student who was doing his MA thesis. He discovered it, oh, I forget how many years ago, but some years ago, and I happened to be in Israel when that discovery became known, and I heard him being interviewed on television, and he was absolutely demolished by the interviewer, a young pretty woman who was out for blood because he revealed that a, an important uh, brigade, the Alexandroni Brigade, did the terrible massacre in Tantura. Tantura is very near Caesarea, by the way. It's also on the water. And basically, his life was ruined. Uh, the university retracted their support for his MA thesis. They, they denied all the lies, all, all the, they, 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 they claimed what he's saying is lies. Uh, he, it was taken to court and the judge wouldn't look at the evidence. He had hundreds of interviews, both with Palestinians and with Israelis, and the judge wouldn't look at any of it. It was really a scandal. And just two years ago, an Israeli documentary filmmaker revived the issue. He found some of the surviving soldiers and interviewed them, and you can see them now being interviewed. And they have the same problem that Amos has in admitting what was happening. They just cannot face saying it. And you can see the hesitation. It's not in the Jewish nature to do things like that, you know. The, the, the claims are unbelievable. The, the uh, in, in uncomfortable smile that somebody may have. Uh, this is the heritage of 48 that is acting itself now on a much greater dimension in Gaza. One of the things I'm thinking about is the next generation. I'm thinking about what the children of Gaza are growing up to remember, those who are surviving this with an, or without a limb and wounds. What are they going to remember of this time? But I'm also thinking of the Israeli soldiers, some of whom must be traumatized by what they are doing. You know, not all of them, but some. What are they going to deal with? And I, in fact, I heard a program on NPR about a psychologist dealing with Israeli soldiers, uh, their traumas. The point is that this is utterly devastating. Um, and I will stop here and just let you say, ask, respond, whatever you need. Okay. So thank you so much, Linda. Um, first, we have some announcements from Amar, and then we'll have two more songs by Rod, and then we'll have questions. So please get your questions ready. Um, and I'll pass it to Amar, who has been really uh, fantastic in making sure everything works today. Thank you, Amar. Thank you, Inez. Um, thank you so much, and thank you, Linda, for that really excellent talk. I just want to say that um, Oh, give me one second here. Sorry, I. You know, on December on December fifth, uh, five days ago, we had a talk by a professor named Sami El Arian, who's uh, his family's Palestinian refugees from 1948, and we we heard a two-hour lecture from him. And uh, so, hearing that a few days ago, and then hearing your perspective, Linda, on all this uh, from from a different perspective. You know, I feel really fortunate to hear hear these different perspectives, and uh, in in that same with, with that same sentiment, I'll announce a couple future uh, events. For example, on Thursday, here in the auditorium of the church, here we're going to have Max Blumenthal speaking, who's a he's a journalist, and um, he he's visited Gaza. He spent a lot of time in Gaza and Israel and the West Bank. So he'll be here live on Thursday, and uh, pl please join us if you can. Um, <coughs> a week from today, on December 17th, we have Richard Wolf speaking with us. He's a pretty uh, well-known professor. He spoke here on January 29th, and uh, our, our video of it on our YouTube channel. It has almost a million views. So he's coming back uh, a week from today, and he'll be speaking. It's called... His lecture will be called A Changing World Economy, 
G7, BRICS, capitalism, and socialism. Uh, so I'm not going to announce. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to announce too many more events. We have a lot going on. We have a newsletter that's out. Um, so thank you to Crystal and Dean for getting this together. And the last thing I'll say before passing it back to Inez to, or just I'll, I guess I'll introduce Rod. Um, the last thing I'll say before our music is uh, thank you so much to everyone in the auditorium for joining us today. And thank you to everyone who's online. You know, there's almost 60 people watching on Zoom, so that's so great. Mm -hmm. Friends from Boston and Seattle and Portland and all over the country, Western Mass. Uh, so thank you so much to everyone. And almost uh, 100 people, 200 people watching on YouTube. So thank you so much to everyone. And um, for the people in the auditorium, I'm going to pass around this quick collection basket if anybody wants to uh, pitch in a couple dollars to the church to help us keep these events going. And to the people online, I will share a PayPal link uh, that you can use to donate to the church if you want to. So thank you again so much to Inez for bringing Linda to us today. Thank you, Linda. I look forward to our music and our Q&A. So next up, we will uh, pass the floor to Rod McDonald for another couple of songs. Rod, take it away. Yes, can you unmute? There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, for that uh, very interesting presentation. There's nothing really like personal experience, is there, to talk about. I mean, it. Uh, it's just more powerful when when it's when it's lived and uh, more revealing that was very educational for me uh, to hear I thank you for that Last night I dreamed of my old home My sister and I, where we were young The yellow sun shone through flowering trees We rode the old familiar streets The faces of old friends were near The smiles of children bright and clear my mother sang our favorite songs My father worked his patch of ground When I awoke I was far away In a land where only yesterday After forty years of tyranny The foreign armies had to leave and as I walked the streets of town With my new friends who call it home In the air so newly free This is what they said to me I would not love my country more for victories in foreign wars I did not love my country less When it was occupied and oppressed Not for some politician's speech But for the people strong and free The land so green, the sky above these are the country that I love
Now who can say what takes a man Far away from his own land And yet his dreams will take him home Back to the land where he was born To walk the old familiar roads And see the faces young and old the land so green, the sky above These are the country that I love The land so green, the sky above These are the country that I love Well, that's a song called For the People. Inez asked me before we came on the air about uh, some of my recordings. Um, I have a new one that's been out since the summer. It's called uh, Rants and Romance. And uh, my website's pretty easy to remember. It's Rod MacDonald, M-A-C-D-O-N-A-L-D dot com. You know, I, I um, come from a family uh, a long time ago that was dispossessed. And I, I wouldn't compare the level of brutality involved to what's going on today, but uh, my father's family came from an island off the coast of Scotland that had lived there for a hundred years or more, I don't know how long. And uh, one of the results of losing the war in the 18th century against England was that the English king gave the entire island to one of his victorious uh, military uh, leaders, I suppose you'd call him a general. And um, he evicted everybody, just completely evicted everybody, turned the island into a game preserve for himself and his rich friends. Today it's a bird sanctuary and people uh, aren't allowed are only allowed to go there by the day. Can't even stay overnight. There isn't anywhere to sleep. Uh, the birds have taken over. Perhaps uh, they're more neutral than either the British or the uh, original Scots. I don't know. It's not about you, it's not about me, it's not about you know who. It's already out of your control, no matter what you do. How can you live next to somebody who insists you only have to leave? How can you live with yourself Watching the cities grieve It's not about freedom, it's not about peace It's not about profits or war It's always and only about the things Everyone is fighting for Survival and power in land And of course some personal image of God Hovering over the battlefield 
waiting to give the word. But it's not really about God, is it? God has no reason to take sides. Who can end the suffering? Who can heal the divide? And who can live next to somebody who only insists you have to leave? Who can live with themselves with nowhere left to breathe? It's not about you, it's not about me. It's not about you, no who. It's already out of your control, no matter what you do. How can you live next to somebody who insists you only have to leave? How can you live with yourself watching the city's green? All right, well, thank you for uh, allowing me to share a bit of my music with you folks today. And uh, thank you, Linda, and uh, Dean, and Amar, and Inez, for your uh, wisdom. Thanks a lot. See you soon, I hope. So, so thank you thank so, you so much, much, Rod, and, and you just gained a whole bunch of new fans. Um, we're going to be following you, so thank you so much for, for that, uh, those wonderful songs. Um, I wanted to mention that Linda's book is available from the publisher, Interlink, I-N-T-E-R-L-I-N-K, and also from several online bookstores whose names I will not mention, <laughs> but you know their names. So all proceeds from the book, uh, which cost $20, only $20, are going to the Middle East Children's Alliance. Only the, book, the books that sell. Only the book, well, the books that Linda sells. The publisher will probably give her a cut on the rest. But anyway, so do buy her book and give it especially to your Jewish friends who really need to read it. So we will be taking questions. We have 200 people on YouTube watching us, 60 people online. So this is, you know, um, an incredible opportunity to share with Linda and to uh, have her answer some questions about this amazing book, which is also, I may say, a wonderful literary work, as you probably noticed. She has really become a wonderful writer, 
freeing herself from academic writing and joining the flights of true, um, beautiful prose. So congratulations, Linda, on making that transition. So do you want to come up here and answer questions? Amar wants to go first. So thank you, Amar, again for the technology. And you get to go first as a reward. Thanks, Inez. Uh, and thank you again, Linda. Uh, my question is, based off your experience in Israel and your knowledge of Israeli society, how do you think that this current conflict in Gaza will end? How, how I think the current what? The conflict in Gaza will end. Will uh, end? Yeah, how do you think it will end? I don't know. I, at the moment, I have s no, no peaceful hope. It seems to me that the carnage will go on for, we don't know exactly how long. The United States is doing nothing to stop it. And, uh, and the Israeli government is doing nothing to stop it. Uh, I don't really know how it will end. My worst, I don't know if it's the worst, but one, one of my terrible notions, I mean, it is another Nakba on a much greater scale. And basically, the people of Gaza push towards the Egypt. Egypt doesn't want them right now. The question, where will they be? I, I have no idea. And I don't see any goodwill at the moment coming from anybody. And I don't see any leadership around that can change the picture. In my more ironic moment, I said, we have to wait till China take over the world and we'll see what they do. But, but really, my current feeling is extremely pessimistic. And at the same time, I personally can't give into despair. I remind myself that apartheid in South Africa ended rather suddenly. The Berlin Wall fell. You know, things happen. But how this will happen, I haven't any idea. What I do see is a terrible killing that's going on now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Victor. Thank, thank you, Linda, for that fascinating presentation. Um, the aspect, uh, trying to find threads of optimism is always looking for uh, dissident positions that yeah. may develop among the Israelis and uh, what they're doing. So in that connection, I'd like to ask you a little bit both about uh, how your parents came to their position, which I understand is also uh, part of the, uh, the dissidents, uh, but also um, the whole uh, narrative of the Mizrahi and wh why they came over to the right, and is, is there anything in their experience that could possibly uh, push some of them in a more constructive direction? I can talk about my parents more easily than about the Mizrahi population, but there was a tiny organization in British Palestine in the late 20s and 30s into the 40s called Brit Shalom. It was founded by the philosopher Martin Buber, by Rabbi Yehuda Magnus, who was the head of the Hebrew University, and some other intellectuals basically of German Jewish descent. And it was called Brit Shalom, which means covenant of peace. And my parents actually belonged to that. Why my parents belong to it, I can't say. I mean, why do some people care and others don't? Or, you know, I don't know. They, in a way, from my point of view, it was common sense. The point of that organization was a binational state. And I actually found in my bookcase a tiny pamphlet that belonged to my parents in a frame condition that was published in 1947, literally at the, uh, just before the war, calling for a binational state. But those were tiny voices, nobody cared about that. You know? So that's my own family. My parents did not talk to me or my sister about politics. They did not indoctrinate us or guide us in any way. They left us to develop our own positions. And my sister and I went in very different directions from the same family. Uh, you know, that happens also. Uh, as far as the Mizrahi Jews, I'm not sure if I understood your question quite. Maybe you can repeat that. Well, uh, uh, as, as we know, and as you mentioned, uh, they are a big part of the right-wing constituency, but I just wondered uh, on the basis of their own uh, 
experience being discriminated against by the Ashkenazi, whether that uh, produced any more progressive reactions. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, the, the Arab Jews, as they're called, uh, Jews yeah. who have an Arab culture yeah. and who, who, um, who still cling to that in some ways. Uh, does that give them any commonality or, uh, in their thinking or, or any empathy or sympathy with the Palestinians? There are here and there an occasional one who has sympathy for the Palestinians, but on the whole, they went to the right. And I think that that was a, um, a, a, an unfortunate uh, result of Ashkenazi discrimination and racism against them, that basically they were pushed to the edge of society and were insulted and treated very badly. And then when Begin came into power, he basically shored them up. He, he came from the right wing after, I mean, I, I would backtrack a tiny bit that until Begin and especially under Ben-Gurion, in all the early days, Israel was still what it calls itself a socialist party. And on May Day, there were big, big demonstrations with red flags and banners and so on everywhere. Everybody was celebrating it as a workers' holiday, May 1. But the reality is that it was May 1 for some and not for everybody else. And they would sing the Internationale, but, or the International, as you call it in English, and at the same time not include Palestinians in the labor mo unions, for example. So that was happening, but it was not only not including the Palestinians, but a really attitude of dismissal towards the uh, Arab Jews, and it includes Jews from India and Persia and so on who are not technically Arab, uh, because of big, big cultural differences and because people who have the money and privilege never rush to give it up. Why should they? And I remember particularly one terrible uh, uh, political speech when Paris, who replaced Ben Gurion for a while, was uh, campaigning in a very Mizrahi neighborhood of Tel Aviv, and people were shouting at him, and he just called them, you know, wild rabble and things like that. I mean, it was really quite disgusting, or at least a political mistake, any way you look at it. But, but. Uh, I think really, and another very, very obvious example that I encountered when uh, looking at Palestinian remains, not in the countryside, but on the outskirts of Tel Aviv, because there were quite a few urban neighborhoods or quasi-neighborhoods surrounding Tel Aviv. And in Kfar Shalem, which was Palestinian, Kafar Salame, uh, it became, they mainly moved Yemenite Jews into that village. And when I was there, there were posters around against eviction because the Yemenites were being evicted. Now that it is near Tel Aviv and it's becoming prime real estate, nobody wanted them there. Meanwhile, Palestinians, other Palestinians were being evicted from Jaffa. And Jaffa and Salome are like within half an hour drive from one another. And I remember thinking they should be making common cause, and they were not. And that just shows you the profound division that the Mizrahi ultimately bought the Ashkenazi narrative. And actually, uh, a colleague of mine at the university, I remember talking, he, he came from a Moroccan, non Af North African family but was relating to the Holocaust as if he sat, his family went through it. And he came from Fez or someplace in North Africa. So it is, you know, the power of ideology and national mythology is, is really incredible, including mythology here in America too. You know, I mean, you know, when I came here, I went to school in 1961, 62, in New York and then in California. And I remember, you know, our teachers dismissing the civil rights movement, dismissing Native Americans in class, you know, part of the mythology. Yeah. So I have a question. You said that you have hope for young people. And I know that many colleges have groups called Students for Justice in Palestine. Mm -hmm. Um, but what you need to reach also are young Jewish kids. So 
what is the plan? Is there um, anything going on there that you could tell us? <laughs> yeah, actually I said that I'm worried about young people who are li living through this war, but I certainly do have hope for the young people who are <laughs> protesting the war or having a critical perspective on it. Um, I feel like uh, so far I'm untouchable by mainstream Jewish community, my book. Um, I wrote it actually not for you, but for them. I felt like, yes, I'm giving you information and perspectives you don't have, but I, want, I, I specifically thought my memoir and showing my change of heart through learning things will affect them, but they don't want to hear. And without naming names, I gave a talk recently someplace to some organization that's no Jewish, not lefty, no nothing, just an organization, and they were under pressure from the local synagogue to cancel my talk, and a member of the board of trustees made a noise about inviting me. So the problem for me, I mean, I would love to talk with them. Uh, I've had in two other occasions somebody in the audience really being kind of angry with me, in one of them angry in a disruptive sort of way, I'm used to that. I don't, don't. I can live with that. It's actually harder for me if somebody in the left says to me, "I'm not left enough." That is really painful. But if people on the right attack me, I I know what to say in re in return. Uh, but I don't have any access. In that other talk, a woman came and said, "It would. May I invite? Would you come to my synagogue?" And I said to her, "Good luck. I would love to come if you invite me, but I don't think they want me." So this is the answer right now. Yeah. Kind of following up on that, is there such a thing as a, I would like to call it maybe generic answer that you may have when you are confront? No, is that? Is it? Okay. Is there is there a generic answer that you can come up with, uh, you thought about, when you're confronted with different situations, different subgroups, addressing the issue from different perspectives, and maybe you have like a unifying answer that basically says something like what your point of view is, but not, not allowing them to sort of yeah. crucify you for that, <laughs> or, or, or not, able to not be able to deny the facts that you state. Is there something that you would say that we can also borrow and say? Yeah, I, wish, I wish I had one. The problem is that, at least so far in my experience, it comes up with a person as if having a question and then going into a lecture. And you can stop the lecture by saying, do you have a question to ask? And usually they don't, or it's a silly question or diversion or something. The problem is that there is never a uh, standard objection. Each time I hear something else and I feel I need to respond to that one in particular. Most recently, somebody objected to the word Nakba as being the wrong word. Another, you know, another person said that the Hamas is educating children from age three to want to kill Jews. And I pointed out that at that age, I too was educated to want to kill Arabs, you know. <laughs> but, but each case is its own. The only say thing I'll say also is that I don't feel crucified by this. I feel challenged and I feel that I can rise to the occasion, but it's exhausting. That's the problem, and I wish there was one. And sometimes I say to the person, clearly we are not going to agree and I walk away. And the other thing, which there isn't really an opportunity, but would be the best thing to do, is to say, you know, we can't talk about it here when all these other people are waiting, and so on. we don't have time, but I would be happy to meet with you for coffee and talk more. But I had never had the opportunity to say that. Yeah. And I don't really want to meet with them for coffee, but, but I feel I should, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Linda, thank you for your book. Can you talk louder or into the machine? Yeah. Linda, thank you for your book. It's a beautiful book. You write beautifully. Thank you. And when we were reading, I was closing my eyes and thinking that you were Anne Frank, if she had survived. <laughs> yeah. 
And as if you were any Frank or if you are Linda and you survived and you're here today, thank you. Um, how are you about religion? And how are you about voting in the United States? Because we are out on the streets and we have been celebrating the holidays. Do you celebrate the holidays? Do you light your candles? And do you pray? And do you vote? And should we vote? And when you were talking about tourism in Israel, I have so many questions. When you found, I went to the Holy Land tourism when I was back in Brazil yeah. into being a Christian. And people in the bus that I was there were not even talking to me, my own people from the same church, because I was reading what was Islam. And when we were stopping at the places where we could stop, like Bethlehem, and they were saying, like, watch out. So tourism in Israel, when we have BDS here, if any friends of mine would ask me, where should I go in Israel? I said, don't go, ever. Yeah. And they stopped me at the um, airport in a special room mm -hmm. because I have an Arafat head. Yeah. And I said, I spent so many shekels in your homeland, and you dare to stop me here. So I have so many things inside bullying right now. You know. um, please um, feel free to <laughs> say anything you want after this. Yeah, yeah. It is what you're saying is so unbelievably painful, and so well unjust. Maybe I would say there was a time way back I was teaching a novel ab in class about El Salvador, and uh, a priest in that novel was killed during the war in El Salvador, and a student who was an older man, who was clearly a retiree in the class, uh, asked me, what do you think about religion? And I was not prepared for that question, and I am an, an atheist myself. And I said to him, I think religion is as good or as bad as its practitioners. And we see a lot of terrible things done by religious people and some beautiful things done by religious people. And um, most recently I heard on NPR an Israeli rabbi dismissing the pain of Israeli soldiers, never mind the Palestinians, and saying about them, well, they're just like the garbage collectors. They just have to do what they have to do. And that is a rabbi for the Jewish soldiers. So an, an example of as good or as bad as, as their practice, um, I think it is an extremely hard question spiritually, and even though I'm an atheist, I'm clearly a spiritual person. Um, and, and one of the things that I mentioned in my book is actually divisions uh, between the Mos Muslims and the Druze in Israel, too. We need to remember that also, and there's a history behind that. So, you know, there are all these complications. The, re the region is just crisscrossed with enmities and competitions and, and, and wars, even village to village sometimes, uh, about voting. That is a really, really difficult situation. I mean, many people I know, including my partner, say they absolutely will not vote for Biden, given what Biden is doing in this situation. And the only worry I personally have is, do you want Trump? I mean, these are the choices at the moment. There's no third choice. So, you know, on a purely expedient and selfish and self-defensive American perspective, inside the country, we are better off with Biden and, than Trump. Outside the country, it's a different story. But I'm, I can't tell you what to do, because it's really a question of conscience, but I'm going to vote for Biden. You know, my partner is in New York, so New York will go for Biden regardless whether, you know, whatever. But I, I can't help with that question. I think I'm 
progressive Americans, let alone radical Americans, it's certainly the Palestinian and Arab community in America is in a terrible bind about the voting, of course. And the question is maybe if there's some way to communicate, because the Democratic Party is so opportunistic in, in its policy, wrong, and probably damaging to itself, but whether some way of communicating to them that w if one w votes, one is voting, holding your nose, voting, basically. Yeah. I don't know. Well, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for your book and your talk. Uh, uh, just, um, yeah, go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> you can um, see. I just wanted to say that you, you conf confirmed uh, a comment I had received, I received from a, an Israeli Jew that I met in Paris in 1973, who told me, uh, you know, we lived in peace. We always lived in peace in Israel, the Palestinians and the Jews. Yeah. We lived together for many centuries. That is until, yeah. until mm -hmm. <laughs> politicians got involved. And uh, I suspect, I always suspected the Ashkenazis um, immigration to Israel caused a lot of trouble. Yeah. Uh, because of their, sup I suppose, their superiority, their sense of superiority uh, towards the uh, Semitic people yeah. <laughs> in Israel. So you just confirmed uh, yeah. something that I suspected. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. No, it's true that Jews and, and Palestinians in Tiberias, for example, in Jerusalem, in Hebron, lived in peace. I, in Hebron, mothers, Jewish mothers and, and Palestinian Arab mothers would mil breastfeed each other's children. I mean, it was a whole other time. But once waves of immigration started coming, that, and they were Ashkenazi waves, so they were alien, and they came in a certain number, they came because of the pogroms in Europe. That's before the Holocaust. That's why my family came in the 1880s. But, but, um, but once they started coming, it was a foreign element. But think of the United States. We here don't want immigrants either. And there's plenty of land and space in America. There is need for workers, mm -hmm. and we still don't want them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's very hard to let in a foreign people. And, and, and uh, you know, people want their own. And actually, so we are dealing partly with the rise of nationalism that goes back to the Napoleonic era, essentially. And, um, and nowadays, the whole notion of nations is actually falling apart with mass immigrations that are happening all over the globe. You know, what does it mean to be a nation anymore? Yeah. What can what practical steps can Israel and or the Palestinians take to help the situation? I'm sorry, can you repeat? What practical steps can Israel and or the Palestinians take to help the quest the situation? And then another question, I'll just mention both of them. Where should we buy it the book if not on Amazon? So we already mentioned Interlink Publishing and other there, if you Other check places. the book out on the internet, you'll see various uh, places that will sell it for order online. You can also ask your own bookstore to sell it. I know that the Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge had two copies when I last saw it. Uh, Porter Square may have something, but you can always order it through your bookstore. Uh, there are a couple of copies in the Cambridge Public Library as well. And you can try Thrift Books, which is not associated yeah. with some of the larger internet companies. Yeah, and also Powell in, in uh, Portland, Oregon is selling it. So, Good. you know, it's available from various uh, outlets. It just means looking on the internet. Yeah. Okay, well, if there are there there any other questions? Question. Oh, yes, the other question. What? Oh, oh, what steps we could take. <laughs> oh, here's another one. Here's another one. So you can answer both at the same time. Um, Linda, thank you for your book and talk. Has anyone from the film Israelism asked you to present at those screenings? Your book seems to be exploring some of the same political space as the recently released film Israelism, 
which is now getting some screen screenings and coverage in the New York Times. You and your book would, it would be a rich resource to deepen what Israelism means. Yeah, I saw Israelism, and um, nobody asked me <laughs> to talk. Uh, there is a very progressive synagogue in Brooklyn, New York, that ought to ask me to talk. I mean, there are places that should, and maybe it will happen after the new year. Who knows? Uh, I will be teaching a course for an organization called Wor World Beyond War, and, and I will give them uh, four weeks of d closer discussion of the book, which is interesting. But as far as practical steps, I know what I would like, but of course nobody <laughs> listens to me. So cease fire immediately, and then a really thoroughgoing peace negotiation that is not controlled by the United States, mm -hmm. that it is, it is led and controlled by some neutral countries, third world countries as well as, as European countries in order to give complete and equal voice to both sides. I don't know if the Palestinians are willing to do that. I don't think that the Israelis are willing to do that either at the moment. So, you know, to speak about that is to speak of the lion and the lamb. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. Yeah. So, um, let's just remember that we did light a peace candle and we hope for peace uh, in our time. Yep. And we want to thank Linda so much for her talk. And don't forget to buy the book. She's donating everything that she sells today to the Middle East Children's Alliance to whom you can also contribute. They are really helping out the situation in Gaza, as are several other organizations that to whom you could contribute. So let's all thank Linda, and um, thank Rod McDonald he's for his you wonderful singing, you. and thank Amar. So over and out. And thank <laughs> all of you very, very much. It was lovely to talk to you.